Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you, Driehaus Foundation and Dr. Mulgrave Harry for instigating this important symposium and for your kind invitation to me. Likewise, I am privileged to be in the presence of such distinguished scholars and thinkers. Now, who thought up this incredibly cumbersome title? Let's ignore it. <clears throat> One might ask, why is Austrian-American architect Richard Neutra the touchstone for this gathering? After all, what is so different about his thinking and his architecture, which seems to embody the standard repertoire of canonical modernism? The answer is that although he is celebrated for his beautiful asymmetrical planes dissolving into the landscape, as they do here at the Busserius House. As Harry just pointed out, Neutra was 70 years ahead of his time in his urgent quest to reorient architecture to acknowledge the role of the body and the senses in design. I'm going to divide my time into three parts, an overall historical context, some background, and finally, Neutra's strategies for creating that exultant dance of connection among environment to the building and the body. To, frame, to provide a framework for the answer, let us go back in time to another lecture to the University of Leipzig on a cold November evening in 1893 when the German art historian August Marzal delivered a sharp rejoinder to the architectural profession then agonizing over what style is appropriate for a new century, a new modernity, and new technologies such as the steel frame. By the way, this anguish is embodied by the very building in which we sit today. This is a Gothic revival cladding on a steel frame designed by the great firm Holabert and Roche. This, of course, was the very firm for which Neutra worked as a draftsman number 208 on the Palmer House, another steel frame building with a historicist dressing right down the street. This response to modernity baffled the young zealot Neutra, fresh from the ghost of the Habsburg Empire and yearning for the promise of a vibrant young America. Anyway, that November evening in Leipzig, Schmarzau threw down a gauntlet. Style is not the point, he said. Rather, architecture's primary task, its most noble and unique task, is to understand space as a physiological and psychological experience, the body moving in space, rather than as a static form or as a historical style. While no evidence connects Neutra to Schmarzau, it is clear that Neutra may be the first architect to advance architecture's primary purpose in the same way that Schmarzau daringly advanced. Neutra's writings and work were apolitical and ahistorical in the sense that, although his work can be readily located in a particular period of 20th century architecture, he intended to bypass history in favor of ancient genetic ancestry and the sensory needs of the contemporary human. While millennia of architects have intuitively harnessed today's knowledge of engaging the senses in design, as Professor Mulgrave has pointed out, Neutra was the first to harness the new tools of science on behalf of that experience. His architecture may also require a change in language. For example, his compositions are not really buildings, but constellations of sensual opportunities, or they are kinetic canvases primed for human endeavor. They are not interventions, our favorite architectural word, but fabric, weaving, setting, and structure together. He himself called his houses sensoriums, or soul anchorages. As early as 1920, Neutra promoted a holistic connection between cognition and the body's nervous and sensory systems. Neutra also believed that, that each organism is structurally connected, connected to a specific environment, that, that in fact there is no single objective out, environment out there. This is really important, but one that is a specific contra, construct between one species and its own habitat, a construct evolved over centuries. For example, a squirrel's eyes are tailored to running along horizontal tree branches. We may be standing 10 feet below that same tree, but we experience a completely different tree. Neutra's prescient grasp of this structural coupling is an area of research today known as embodiment or inactive cognition. 
To set the stage this morning, a bit on Neutra's background. Born in 1892 into that cauldron of modernism, fin de siècle Vienna, as a university student, Neutra discovered the new discipline of environmental psychology, which sought to quantify the environment's impact on the senses and perception, a discipline co-founded by German philosopher Wilhelm Wundt. One can only wonder that Neutra could even plow through Wundt's 1874 Principles of Physiological Psychology, a tome so dense and arcane that even Wundt's prote brilliant protégés, such as G. Stanley Hall, despaired. In fact, they would introduce Wundt's um, own books with no d little degree of exasperation. But there is no question that Neutra immediately grasped the, the potential for architects who understood the relationship among body, brain, and the environment. Note the chapter head, top right, of part one, whose seven words could sum up Neutra's entire raison d'etre, the bodily substrate of the mental life. And despite looking like a caricature of a dry, old, wizened euroscientist, elsewhere Wundt concentrates on rhythm as the very basis for consciousness, introducing rhythm or the metronome and the human stride the, the body walking, jumping, leaping, and all kinds of dances, he writes. For Wundt and for Neutra, rhythm in architecture is biological, it is spatial. Whether the allegro of casement windows or the basso profundo of post and beam. At about the same time in 1911, Neutra also discovered Frank Lloyd Wright's seminal Vosmuth portfolios. Neutra said that I could only marvel at the drawings. The houses really had no walls. Rooms opened up in any direction. Just as with Wundt, Neutra immediately understood that Wright's architecture promised new tools, new directions. Wright's organizations of solid and void, corner window arrangements that enabled a long diagonal view, sudden changes in height, as we all know, compression expansion, and broad overhangs all had a searing impact on Neutra. Added to this, after serving in World War I, he worked as a laborer and dog's body for the great Swiss garden designer and theorist, the modernist Gustav Aumann. Aumann not only taught Neutra how to plant seedlings on his knees, working the earth, he exposed Neutra to exciting new landscape theories coming out of England and America, such as the endless view. Meaning a view that opened and extended out to the horizon and the idea of a constantly varying surface. Such views were, of course, luxuries for hoi polloi, like us. Um, previ previously, such endless views were privileged only for the aristocracy and the elite. A little later, Neutra embraced evolutionary biology and the hypothesis that humans had evolved on the savannas of East Africa. That hypothesis posited that the human cognitive, nervous, and skeletal framework were fundamentally connected to or structurally coupled with attributes of that early landscape with an endless view of the horizon, bodies of water, copses of trees near and far. We carry that early landscape with us as part of our genetic ancestry, Neutra believed. And note that just like the ancient acacia tree on the left, Neutra's drip lines of tree canopies never compromise that endless view. See on the right, let me play with this again. See that drip line? It's always above or at the roof line. Neutra established his own practice in Los Angeles. He taught at the Bauhaus in 1930, where notably at the same time Wundt's ideas were taught in addition to Gestalt, Freud, and Jung. He visited Japan, which confirmed his conviction about integrating building and setting, and especially concepts of borrowed landscapes, and died in 1970. His work and even his personal reputation out well out of fashion and favor. Wundt instigated a lifetime of unremitting study and personal relationships for Neutra in all manner of sciences. The books on his shelves demonstrate this wide-ranging curiosity, insects in your life, the science of seeing, 
sensory deprivation, phylobiology, and on and on. And Neutra read the, many of them, annotating them carefully. So, so the annotations, the marginalia, the, the careful listing of, of pages that were important to him, um, always in pencil, the, the mark of a true bibliophile. Um, <laughs> um, very interesting indeed. As Harry just pointed out in his own most famous book, Survival Through Design, um, there are 74 or so scientists from Hippocrates to cutting edge research, cutting edge researchers, and 60 or, or so cultural figures from St. Augustine to Zola. What, ri what emerges from an analysis of all these individuals is no dilettante, but someone with an almost fierce Old Testament intimacy with these figures. What also emerges is that Neutra constantly sought out rationally based thinkers, such as Democritus, a Greek who dared to suggest that reason, not Zeus and the gods, could explain the universe, or the Enlightenment's Lemaitre, the French physiologist and materialist who impudently reminds us that we are animals. Moving on to those calibrated canvases, I'd like to note Neutra's key tenets that ground his own philosophy of biorealism. Tenant one, Neutra understood that the mind and body are a mix of genetic inheritance and plasticity. The degree of plasticity depended on individual experience and whether the environment nurtures or impoverishes the organism. Therefore, an architect had to have some understanding of the biological genetic inheritance in order to assist in designing spaces that acknowledge those ancient environments rather than thwarting genetic ancestry. Neutra rejects both the Cartesian duality, of which there's been much discussion in the last 24 hours, he rejects both, both the Cartesian duality separating mind and body, as well as the adage, man versus nature, as both being, quote, perilous nonsense. Nature may be sublime or picturesque, terrifying or benevolent, or romantic, all well and good, but what matters is that is nature's utter reality. Human nature and the, hu the nature of the natural world are indivisible from the largest to the smallest scale. As he says, the universe of which we are a part is a dynamic continuum. The organism permits no severing of the hereditary from the environmental. Indeed, every cell is the environment of every other cell, like the waters of two tributaries which have flowed together into a common riverbed. And note, um, I, I once asked Mrs. Wrench, um, what about the kids? <laughs> it's about a 200-foot drop out there. And she said, in a good Swiss motherly fashion, I just had to tell them once, we never had a problem. <laughs> like Lemaitre proposed, we are part of the animal world. In my favorite chapter of survival, Neutra abruptly jettisons what of modernism most cherished sayings, Louis Sullivan's form ever follows function. No, it doesn't. Quite the opposite, Neutra replies. Alluding to evolution, he says, function can only occur with the appropriate form, just like the male epididi fly, who kills many smaller insects and wraps them up in a big white balloon to get the girl. Well, here's the funny part. Um, about 700 of the many thousands of species of the impedidi fly, have figured out why go to all the effort of killing? Why not just give her a really big empty balloon? So lying suits survival. Camouflage works. In any case, as Harry mentioned and as Richard Driehaus mentioned last night, the shape of something shapes us. And maybe tenant four, maybe rationalizing his own designs, for Neutra, rectilinearity is a biological fact. Quote, we have a wonderfully acute sense for it in the vestibulum of our inner ear, which re where resides our precious sense of equilibrium. The plumb, the vertical, shows us precisely the direction of the pull of gravity and its relation to the water level of the horizon, and with the vertical, intersecting at a, in a crisp, sharp, emotionally satisfying right angle. <laughs> a sense for the right angle has truly been grown into us by creation. 
I'd like to spend my last few minutes uh, not on theory but on praxis, recounting just a few of Neutra's strategies to manipulate perception on behalf of stretching space. I call them strategies for trickery because for Neutra, perception is reality. Quote, I can transform the dry heat inside a sauna into a pleasurable experience when I introduce a large expanse of thermal pane, i.e. window, that overlooks a snowy landscape. He argued that body odors and an unventilated um, uh, courtroom could affect the outcome of justice. And he said, and his tricks are, quote, exactly what the architect should strive for, especially now, with a more and more cramped situation. This is in the 50s. We are interested in stretching space. There are no owners who ever came to me and said, can you make it look small? They all say, make it large. Strategy one, or the first one I'll choose anyway, healing the boundary between indoors and out. Um, we have several, um, I think you all can get the point that the, the, the transgression of the boundary is key for Neutra. In every single publicity um, photograph of every elementary and high school, there is this deliberate location of the chairs in a circle that transgresses the boundary, or rather melds the two. Neutra darkly predicted that, quote, if we fabricate an environment but cannot make it an extension of ourselves, the end of the race may be in sight. For me, this sketch is one of Neutra's most important drawings. Note again the drip line of the tree, never compromising your endless view of the horizon. The goal is always to extend ourselves into the environment. Continuing that theme, as we know, rights, sacred space in the home is the hearth. Rather, for Neutra, the sacred space is the terrace, preferably radiantly heated, a real interstitial frisson of tactile liberation between indoors and outdoors. I work really hard on that phrase. I hope you like it. <laughs> As we know, let's see, um, the second strategy is Neutra's famous spider leg. Shooting behind, beyond the building envelope, it mimics the protective edge of a tree canopy and acts as interstitial space. This is where Bambi can linger a moment before stepping out into the dangerous appeal of the bright open meadow. The spider leg projects well beyond the mitered right angle of the glass, permitting that longer diagonal view. Some contemporary tools of analysis argue that diagonal views maximize a sense of spaciousness. As Neutra writes, quote, given this freedom, no structural arrangements need interfere with the health of the retina. Today, free prefabricated window wall frames of concrete or metal composition are slapped into place just where most people might wish for an unfettered view to the outside. These systems may be cheaper, but emotional strain, sensory ennui, and ophthalmological fatigue are not inexpensive. In other words, implementing Neutra's ideas are a bargain. Recalling that we are animals, at the Miller House we see in Palm Springs, we see another Neutra trademark strategy. This night curtain enhances interior privacy while extending the visible radius of space at night through the strip of lighting at the edge of the overhang. We are a little braver. We can see what is out there, friend or foe. So this is an extension of the radius of your, um, your index of livability. According to Neutra, your index of livability um, is how, how often you can use a space day and night. And so this night curtain um, in, enlarges that radius for you. Back to the body moving in space, choreograph and calibrate the cadence in the path of travel as Neutra saw in Japan. Slow the body down, force it to pay attention to balance, to be in the present moment as it negotiates a 90 degree turn and changes in height. So um, this is something that we're working on right now. This happens to be a collaboration between Gerrit Ekbo, the great landscape architect, and Richard Neutra. Um, 
but as you can see, I've blown up the, the procession from the street, and you're negotiating all the time. And in Roman times, if you were a, a public servant, you were, had a hard day at the basilica, um, you would come home and, and you would take off that public persona of the, the toga, and you would, you would then put on the d domestic clothing. Well, this is exactly what's happening happening here in a different kind of way, where, where this is interstitial space between public and private. Strategy seven, mirrors are a poor man's way of stretching space. Notably, a recent study analyzed Neutra's view lines, axes, and pathways through some of his houses using a methodology called space syntax analysis. However, while it demonstrated that Neutra's buildings provide clear pathways and good sight lines, the analyses didn't take into account one particular strategy for trickery, mirrors. On the left, the mirrors double the mountain lake in a waiting room for cancer patients waiting for cobalt treatments in the 1950s that typically would kill you if the cancer didn't. On the right, a full height mirror actually creates an axis axis where none exists. So if you, this is the blueprint of the building, there's the, the mirror over there and it's reflecting what's out here. So you get a marvelous sense of spaciousness by this full height mirror along this wall. It's a small house. In conclusion, I leave you with a sketch of a body getting ready for reading in bed. This is Neutra's musing on exactly where the reading light should be for just 20th century America's greatest architectural patron, the man who commissioned both Wright's Falling Water, 1939, and Neutra's Kaufman Desert House, 1947. This, of course, is the body of Edgar Kaufman, the hand, the eye, the posture of one special, unique individual equipped with a generic, standard-issue human body. Neutra describes the utter reality of the physiology of space through the humble act of waking up, describing the radius of that physiology through the parts of the human body. Our breathing lungs, our stepping legs, our reaching arms, our physiological scales, and furnish modules of space of what we first need within arm's reach in the morning. Thank you.